Good evening, we are on the 30th of October, 20... No, the time is about 19.40. So it's about 20 to 8, almost, Sunday 30th of October. I'm a day late with this saint. Um, his name, I called it the other day, but I didn't actually have time. Saint Narcissus, October the 29th, 2nd century. I'll just begin with a small prayer in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Prayer to my guardian angel. Angel of God, my guardian dear, to whom his love commits me here, ever this night be at my side, to light and guard, to rule and guide. Amen. Holy Michael the Archangel, defend me in this day of battle. Be my safeguard against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, I humbly pray. And do thou, Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, thrust down to hell Satan and all the wicked evil spirits who wander through the world for the ruin of souls. Amen. I know nothing about this saint. His name is Saint Narcissus. He was Bishop of Jerusalem, 2nd century. Saint Narcissus was born towards the close of the 1st century and was almost four score years old when he was placed at the head of the Church of Jerusalem, being the 30th Bishop of that see. Eusebius assures us that the Christians of Jerusalem preserved in his time the remembrance of several miracles which God had wrought by this holy bishop, one of which he relates as follows. One year, on Easter Eve, the deacons were un provided with oil for the lamps in the church, necessary at the solemn divine office that day. Narcissus ordered those who had care of the lamps to bring him some water from the neighbouring wells. This being done, he pronounced a devout prayer over the water then bade them pour it into the lamps, which he did, they did, and it was immediately converted into oil, to the great surprise of the faithful. Some of his this miraculous oil was kept there as a memorial at the time when Eusebius wrote his history. The veneration of all good men for this holy bishop could not shelter him from the malice of the wicked. Three incorrigible sinners, fearing his inflexible severity in the observance of ecclesiastical discipline, laid to his charge a detestable crime, which Eusebius does not specify. They confirmed their atrocious calumny by dreadful oaths and imprecations, one wishing he might perish by fire, another that he might be struck with a leprosy, and the third that he might lose his sight if what they alleged was not the truth. Notwithstanding these protestations, their accusation did not find credit, and some time after the divine vengeance pursued the calumnators. The first was burnt in his house, with his whole family, 
by an accidental fire in the night. The second was struck with a universal leprosy. And the third, terrified by these examples, confessed the conspiracy and the slander and by the abundance of tears which he continually shed for his sins, lost his sight before his death. Narcissus, notwithstanding the slander, had made no impression on the people to his disadvantage, could not stand the shock of the bold calumny or made it an excuse for leaving Jerusalem and spending some time in solitude, which had long been his wish. He spent several years undiscovered in his retreat, where he enjoyed all the happiness and advantage which a close conversation with God can bestow that his church might not remain destitute of a pastor, the neighbouring bishops of the province, after some time, placed in it Pius, and after him, Germanion, who dying in a short time, was succeeded by Gordius. Whilst this last held the sea, Narcissus appeared again, like one from the dead. The whole body of the faithful, transported at the recovery of their holy pastor, whose innocence had been most authentically vindicated, conjured him to reassume the administration of the diocese. He acquiesced, but afterwards bending under the weight of extreme old age, made St. Alexander his coadjutor. St. Narcissus continued to serve his flock and even after other churches. By his assiduous prayers and his earnest exhortations to unity and concord, as St. Alexander testifies in his letter to the Arsinoites in Egypt, where he says that Narcissus was at that time about 116 years old. The Roman martyrology honours his memory on the 29th of October. The pastors of the primitive church animated with the spirit of the apostles, were faithful imitators of their heroic virtues, discovering the same fervent zeal, the same contempt of the world, the same love of Christ, if we truly respect the church as the immaculate spouse of our Lord, we will incessantly pray for its exaltation and increase and beseech the Almighty to give its pastors according to his own heart, like those who appeared in the infancy of Christianity, and that no obstacle on our part may prevent the happy effects of their zeal. We should study to regulate our conduct by the holy maxims which they inculcate. We should regard them as the ministers of Christ. We should listen to them with docility and attention. We should make their faith the rule of ours and shut our ears against the language of profane novelty. Because that's only nine minutes, rather than me make too many individuals, I'm going to continue reading The Lives of the Saints, and this one is October XXX, so that's 30. St. Marcellus the Centurion, Martyr, 
from the authentic acts of his martyrdom in Baronius and Surius, and most correctly in Ruinart, who has published with them the short acts of St. Cassian. A.D. 298. This is St. Marcellus the Centurion. The birthday of Emperor Maximian, Herculeus, was celebrated in the year 298 with extraordinary feasting and solemnity. Pompous sacrifices to the Roman gods made a considerable part of this solemnity. Marcellus, a Christian centurion or captain in the Legion of Trajan, then posted in Spain, not to defile himself with taking part in these impious abominations, cast away his military belt at the head of his company, declaring aloud that he was a soldier of Jesus Christ, the eternal King. He also threw down his arms and the vine branch, which was the mark of his post of centurion, for the Roman officers were forbid to strike a soldier with any instrument except a vine branch, which the centurions usually carried in their hands. The soldiers informed Anastasius Fortunatus, prefect of the legion, by whose order Marcellus was committed to prison. When the festival was over, this judge ordered Marcellus to be brought before him and asked him what he meant by his late proceedings. Marcellus said, When you celebrated the emperor's festival on the 12th, before the calends of August, the day on which Maximian had been declared Caesar, I said aloud that I was a Christian and could serve no other than Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Fortutanus told him that it was not in his power to connive at such at his rashness, and that he was obliged to lay his case before the Emperor Maximian and Constantius Caesar. Spain was immediately subject to Constantius, who was at this time Caesar and most favourable to the Christians. But Marcellus was sent under a strong guard to Aurelian Agricolaus, vicar to the prefect of the Praetorium, who was then at Tangier in Africa. Agricolaus asked him, whether he had really done as the judge's letter set forth. And upon his confessing the fact, the vicar passed sentence of death upon him for desertion and impiety, as he called his action. So Marcellus was forthwith led to execution and beheaded on the 30th of October, which is actually today. His relics were afterwards translated from Tangier to Lyon in Spain and are kept in a rich shrine in the chief parish church in that city of which he is the titular saint. We justly honour the martyrs whom God himself honours. Martyrdom is the most heroic act of divine love and the most perfect and entire sacrifice man can make of himself to God. Of all the goods of this life, man has nothing more precious and dear than his life and honour. And what stronger proof can he give 
of his fidelity to the law of God than to embrace with joy an ignominious eos and cruel death rather than consent to sin? Nor does anything require a more heroic degree of courage and firmness than to suffer torments at the very thought of which nature shudders. God proportions his rewards and crowns to the measure of our sufferings and love for him. How great, then, is the glory, how abundant the recompense which attends the martyrs. They rejoiced to see their torments redoubled manifold, because they had before their eyes the incomparably greater increase of grace, divine love and eternal glory. If we shrink under the least sufferings, it is plain our faith and our idea of everlasting bliss must be very weak and our love faint and imperfect. That's the final. I'll be doing the other one the Quint, Saint Quintin Martyr separately because it, it is uh, a longer reading probably although I could it's the last one in October I will continue because it will be just on its own and then we're into November so I will continue with the final saint in this but Butler's book for Saint Quintin Martyr October 31 so that's tomorrow but they can all be joined together Saint Quintin Martyr October 31st from his acts in Surius Surins Surius written in a good style before Saint Elgius's time but later than Nestorius the author assures us that he compiled them from a history wrote by one who was present at the first translation of the martyr's relics, 55 years after his death. But the author has added circumstances from popular traditions with a fetter, which are not of equal authority. Other acts of St. Quintin, but of an inferior stamp, are given us by Cloud Herm. Hemere in his history of the town of St. Quintins, A.D. 287. St. Quintin was a Roman, descended of a centurion family, and is called by historian, his historian the son of Zeno. Full of zeal for the kingdom of Jesus Christ, and burning with a holy desire to make his powerful name and the mysteries of his love and mercy known among the infidels. He left his country, renounced all prospects of preferment, and attended by St. Lucian of Bovos, made his way to Gaul. They preached the faith together in that country till they reached Amiens in Picardy, where they parted. Lucien went to Beauvais, and having sown the seeds of divine faith in the hearts of many, received the crown of martyrdom in that city. St. Quintin stayed at Amiens, endeavouring by his prayers and labours to make that country a portion of our Lord's inheritance, desiring nothing so earnestly as to destroy the kingdom of the devil, that the name of God might be glorified. He besought the author of all good, without ceasing, that he would infuse his saving knowledge and holy love into the souls of those to whom he announced the divine law. God made him equally powerful in words and works, and his discourses were authorised and strongly recommended 
by great numbers of miracles and illustrated and enforced by a most holy and mortified life. The reward of his charitable labours was the crown of martyrdom, which he received in the beginning of the reign of Maximian Herculeus, who was associated in the empire by Diocletian in the year 286. Maximian made Rictius Varus prefect of the Praetorium, whose hatred of the Christian religion has stored the martyrology with lists of many illustrious martyrs. Varus seems to have resided at Trias, the net metropolis of the Belgic Gaul, but making a progress into the second Gaul when he was near Sossons. He had intelligence of the great progress the Christian faith had made at Amiens and resolved to cut him off, who was the author of this great change. When he arrived at Amiens, he ordered St. Quintin to be seized, thrown into prison and loaded with chains. The next day, the holy preacher was brought before the prefect who assailed his constancy with promises and threats and finding him proof against both, ordered him to be whipped unmercifully and then confined to a close dungeon without the liberty of receiving either comfort or assistance from the faithful. In two other examinations, before the same magistrate, his limbs were stretched with pulleys on the rack till his joints were dislocated. His body was torn with rods of iron wire. Boiled pitch and oil were poured on his back and lighted torches applied to his sides. The holy martyr, strengthened by him whose cause he defended, remained superior to all the cruel arts of his barbarous persecutor and preserved a perfect tranquility of mind in the midst of such torments as filled the spectators with horror. When Rictius Varus left Amiens, he commanded Quintin to be conducted to the territory of the Veromandui, whither he was directing his course in his return. The capital of that country was called Augusta Veromandurorum. In this city of the Veromandui, the prefect made fresh attacks upon the champion of Christ with threats and promises, and being ashamed to see himself vanquished by his courage and virtue, virtue caused his body to be pierced with two iron wires from the neck to the thighs and iron nails to be struck under his nails and in his flesh in many places, particularly into his skull and lastly his head to be cut off. This was executed on the 31st of October in the year 287, 287. The martyr's body was watched by the soldiers till night and then thrown into the river Somme. But it was recovered by the Christians some days after and buried on a mountain near the town. Fifty-five years after, 
it was discovered by Eusebia, a devout lady and a certain blind woman recovered her sight by the sacred relics. The knowledge of the place was again lost in the persecution of Julian the Apostate, though a chapel which was built near it remained. When in the beginning of the year 641, St. Eli Gaius, Bishop of Noyon and the Vermandois caused the holy re relics to be sought. And when they were discovered, together with the great nails with which the body had been pierced, he distributed these nails, the teeth and hair in other places, and enclosed the rest of the sacred treasure in a rich shrine of his own work, which he placed behind the high altar, as St. Owen relates in his life. A new stately church of St. Quintin was built in the reign of Louis de Bonaire, and another translation of the relics was made on the 25th of October, 825. They were removed to Leon for fear of the Normans, but brought back on the 30th of October, 885, and are still kept in the great church, which was in the hands of monks, from the time of Erbatran, the first abbot, till these were afterwards dispersed by the inroads of the Normans. In the following age, secular canons were put in possession of this famous church. Martyrdom, when we are called to it, is an homage we owe to God and a debt due to faith and religion. Happy are they whom God, by a special grace, allows to seal their fidelity to him by their blood. How great is the honour and happiness for a poor mortal man and a poor sinner to lay down his mean, miserable life for him, who out of infinite love for us, gave his most precious life. Martyrs are holocausts offered to the divine love and glory. They are witnesses, as the word imports in the original Greek, bearing testimony to the infinite power and goodness of God, in which they place an entire confidence, and to the truth of his holy revealed faith, which they confirm with their blood. No testimony can be more authentic, more glorious to God, more edifying to the faithful, or more convincing to infidels. It is by the constancy of martyrs that our holy religion is established. God was pleased to choose it for one of the means by which he would accomplish this great work. Are we witnesses to God and his holy religion, at least by lives of self-denial, meekness and sanctity? Or do we not rather by a contrary deportment disgrace his holy church, of which we have the honour to be members and expose his adorable name to the blasphemies of infidels? Oh, what a saint! <laughs> I mean, the visions of it are just 
horrendous, aren't they? I mean, goodness me, the grace that God must have given that saint, that last one, to go through that. Oh, gosh, I feel quite ill. Just thinking that the images. Whew, I'm glad I've got a rest from reading. So it'll be November the 1st. All, all, all the saints I'll be reading next time. Thank you so much for listening. May God bless you and heal you. I'm sending you his peace in abundance. And may you always be happy and joyful in the Lord. But hopefully they won't all be horrendous like this this poor saint and the other two. Oh dear, dear, dear. Thank you and God bless. Good night.